School choice is winning in America, folks. We are winning. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, we're going to start with a little PowerPoint presentation, and I'd like to say that in 2011, school choice winning. On April 4th, 2011, the Supreme Court rejects the challenge to Arizona's tuition scholarship tax credit. The high court rules that because tax credits leave money in the hands of taxpayers, they never become public funds. As a result, under federal law, taxpayers do not have standing to challenge the program. 30,000 kids in Arizona, 370 private schools, and everybody else who's doing this now and may do this in the future, winning. Boom. <laughs> Later in the week, the Arizona legislature increases the amount of the tax credit for couples from $1,000 to $1,500 per couple. What that means is directly the tax that those couples pay to the state of Arizona, they can now pay to a scholarship organization and send more kids to private schools. DC kids winning. As part of the federal budget deal last week, Congress reauthorized the District of Columbia School Voucher Program. It'll now be around guaranteed for five more years, and they're going to expand it. Currently, 1,700 kids in DC at 50 private schools winning. Kaboom. <laughs> the first local universal voucher program that a school board approved in Douglas County, Colorado. In this program, the school board unanimously said that they would pay tuition for hundreds of their own students to attend private schools. The first year of the program in 2012 will give 500 kids in Douglas County School District $4,500 to go to the private school of their choice. <laughs> Indiana is set to pass the largest school voucher program. The School Choice Scholarship Bill passed the House and is now being reviewed in the Senate. Governor Mitch Daniels has promised to sign it. And barring the exodus of the Senate Democrats, again fleeing to another state, it will become law this legislative session. The number of scholarships available for the first year will be 7,500. 15,000 scholarships the second year, and by 2003, there will be an unlimited number of kids in Indiana that can use a voucher to go to the school of their parents' choice. <laughs> school choice is winning in America, folks. We are winning. There's currently 20 school voucher and tax credit programs in the nation. 11 of these are school vouchers. Nine are tax credits. Right now, there's over $700 million in public funds that now go away from the public school monopoly and follow the kids to the school of their parents' choice. Over the past five years, that amount has doubled from $300 million. We've seen a 75% increase in the number of kids that have private school choice in America in the last five years, 75% increase. This legislative session, these are the states that have voucher bills. The threats are to the unions, not to us. And the evidence is in about school voucher programs. There's actually 10 empirical studies that have used random assignment, which is the gold standard for social science, that examine outcomes for students in voucher programs. Nine of those studies found that vouchers improve student outcomes. One study found no visible difference. And what that means is in that case, those kids are doing just as well as kids in public schools using a voucher for about 50% of the cost of their public school tuition. And there were also 19 empirical studies with random assignment, gold standard for social science, that found a positive effect for the kids that remain in the public schools from the competition from vouchers. And again, vouchers, the evidence is in. When you look at the best research out there, school choice works, kids do better. In charter schools, kids are also winning. 
Charter schools is, continues to be the largest example of education privatization where nonprofit groups and private groups have contracts with government authorizers to run schools. The school finance mechanism for charter schools is exactly like a voucher or a tax credit in that the money is attached to the backs of kids, the financing mechanism works exactly the same way, the school doesn't get paid if the parents don't choose the school and the kids don't show up there. There's 5,000 charter schools serving 2 million children, 500,000 kids right now at least are on waiting lists in the United States for charters. There's 14 communities where more than 20% of the kids are in charter schools, 72 communities where more than 10% of the kids are in charter schools. Carolyn Hawksby's from Harvard University, her, she's an economist there that does education research. Her famous study said that you only need 6% of kids opting out of the public schools to make a difference in those public school communities. That's the level of competition that you need, 6%. So we're way above that in many, many cities. Three cities have more than one third of their public school students in charters. Detroit with 32%, no surprise there. Washington DC, 36%. New Orleans has 71%. Speaking of New Orleans, it's the most market-driven school system in the United States. 71% of all New Orleans kids are in charter schools. 77% of kids in K through eight are in charter schools. What this means is no longer in New Orleans can people argue that charter schools are creaming the best students because they're serving every student in the public school district. Um, the dropout rate for New Orleans public schools fell 31% from 2008 to 2010. Since 2005, the dropout rate has been cut in half, fallen by 50%. In August of 2005, no one would have imagined that by August of 2010, New Orleans would be the most improved school district in the United States. In 2005, 66% of the schools were failing. In 2010, 26% of the schools are failing. And every indicator, student achievement for reading and math, um, AP scores for students in high school, college acceptance rate, New Orleans is doing better. Boom. <laughs> in Louisiana, we just helped pass a statewide student-based budgeting. There's now 25 districts where the public school funds follow the kids to the schools of their choice. What we did in Louisiana is we got 10 superintendents of different parishes, both small and large, after we had been bringing people there from other districts to tell them about how much better it was for principals and superintendents when schools control their resources and the money follow the child. After doing this for about a year, 10 superintendents volunteered to do this in their schools and they stood about a month ago with Governor Jindal and announced that they plan to have the money follow the kids in their school. And Andre Alonzo, who's a, the CEO of Baltimore City Schools, which I would argue is becoming the best school district in America, has been very aggressive where he went to Louisiana with us and talked about what's happened in his school district in four years, and he's the big guy on the left. In four years, he took 600 administrators from the central office and took $100 million that they were paying them and gave it to the schools. And then the principals, before he came four years ago, controlled 4% of their budget. They now control 80% of their budget. And in those four years in Baltimore, they have cut the African-American dropout rate. So four years ago, 1,500 African-American males dropped out of high school. In 2010, it was 497. Because you know what? When the money follows the kids and you have at-risk African-American kids that are having a hard time, if those kids leave your high school, guess what else leaves your high school? The money. Incentives work. When the money follows the kids, schools rapidly change their behavior. Uh-oh. See, I did it. Finally, the last development I think that is very exciting is what's known as parent trigger laws in America. And what a parent trigger is, is that 
In an individual school, if 51% of the parents vote to do something different in California with their school, the school district has to do what they want. So the first school was McKinley Elementary School, which is a small school in Compton Unified. Compton Unified is a school district that in 2010, 1.5% of their students made it to college. Let me say that again, 1.5% of Compton high school kids that actually graduated made it to college. So you can see why parents there might want to do something different with their schools. So basically, what the parent trigger law, it allows a grassroots efforts by parents to vote in new management for their schools. McKinley Elementary voted to have a local charter school manage their schools. Then Compton Unified said, we refuse to accept this petition, even though it was California law. And they said, not only that, we're going to enforce a verification system on parents where every parent has to come down to the district office and be interviewed and show their identification and prove, even though their kids ob obviously enrolled in the school. And this is in a community where it's almost 100% Hispanic parents and families. And you can imagine the intimidation of trying to do something better for your school and then having a school district tell you that you have to prove who you are before that you'll accept that vote. A superior court judge two weeks ago issued an injunction against Compton Unified for violating the constitutional rights of those parents. And they ordered Compton to count the parent trigger, trigger petitions and signatures. And this represents a huge victory for parents of Compton, for parents of California, and for parents of the nation. And now that there's a parent trigger law in California, states across the country are replicating that school, where an individual parents at an individual schools don't have to wait for the state or the district to do something to make their school better. They can take it into their own hands. In 2011, school choice winning. Okay. So for the next part of our presentation, I'm actually going to do a little interview with Claire Mullen, who's the Senior Program Officer for the Gleason Family Foundation. And this year at the Reason Foundation, we were really in for National School Choice Week. And in our Washington, D.C. office, Nick Gillespie, Gillespie helped me to have a very good presentation with Virginia Walden Ford, who's the founder of the Washington, D.C. Scholarship, with support from the Gleason Family Foundation. Reason TV, during National School Choice Week, I think released 25 school choice education videos because of Nick during National School Choice Week. Really awesome interviews with people like Jeb Bush from Florida and Joel Klein and superintendents across the nation like Deborah Grist, you heard of her in Time Magazine, the Rhode Island superintendent, that when the high school that she was trying to make change in would not do what she asked, she fired the entire staff of the high school because they were not willing to make change for kids. So those are the kind of people our Reason TV videos were able to interview. And then we also screened a showing of the lottery, which was up for an Academy Award for a documentary in Los Angeles that really shows the pain that parents go to when they're on a waiting list and they can't get their kids into a charter school. So now I'm going to turn over to Claire and I'm going to ask her a couple questions. And the first question I have for Claire really is just tell us how National School Choice Week came about. Why now? Why National School Choice Week? I, I would like to tell a little story, funny story about how National School Choice Week was actually conceived. Um, I have two daughters that are in public school in California and um, last year on March 3rd they came home from school and they said, Mommy, Mommy, tomorrow is a really important day and I said, why is that? And they said, because we have to help the teachers. And I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> okay, we'll see what happens. So the next day I drive my kids up to the the turning circle and they get out at the curb and all the teachers are lined up, they're not in the classroom, they're all lined up standing there waiting for the parents. And so I roll down my window and I put my hand out and they give me this stack of California Teacher Association propaganda basically. So I drove into the office where I met uh, with my colleague Tracy Gleason 
And by the time I got there, I was fuming <laughs> because they had basically, you know, indoctrinated my children and the, this, all this propaganda that they were putting out was about um, the budget, the beginning of the budget cuts. And uh, they had a, what they called that day was a day of action in California. And they had organized um, all of their members and their teachers uh, to protest and saying that these cuts hurt kids and you can't cut our budgets, we need more money. And they even went so far as to lay down on the freeway, on the Bay Bridge during rush hour traffic. And basically they brought San Francisco to a standstill and it was all over the media, it was all over the news, it was a huge story. And I said to Tracy, I said, where is our day of action? Why, do, why don't we have this kind of organized action? And she said, well, we should do that. Let's do a week and let's call it National School Choice Week. So that is, that's lit, quite literally how it was born. And basically the idea behind it is to take all of these fantastic organizations that are working so, brilliant work all across the country, for decades, they've been striving to bring school choice and education reform to America. And National School Choice Week is really a marketing tool whereby they can um, raise awareness and shine a spotlight on all the wonderful work that they do. Um, one of the, the, the characteristics of the movement is that all these groups, they've been working largely independently um, they all have a different focus. Some may focus on charter schools. Some may focus on vouchers. Some may focus on anti-union. Um, so it's been hard for them to really coordinate and organize to work together. But really the end goal is the same for all of us, which is to bring excellent education to all children in America. I think I'd like to play a little video. Actually, we had our, so we had our first National School Choice Week, which was in January, and we kicked off at the Reason DC offices um, and went all across the country. And you're going to see some of the events and some of the media attention and just we'll play the video. From January 23rd through January 29th, 2011, more than 200 organizations came together for a week of action to shine a spotlight on effective education options for all children. First ever National School Choice Week. National School Choice Week. This is National School Choice Week. This is School Choice Week. School Choice Week. During the week, over 150 events celebrating school choice were held across the nation from Sacramento to Cincinnati, Orlando to Oregon, and as far away as Alaska and Hawaii. People celebrated the week in their own ways, oftentimes using an abundance of creativity. Rallies to state capitals, town hall meetings, movie screenings, book club meetings, concerts, beach parties, online events, barbecues, expos, pub nights, even grandmas for charter schools coffee houses. Tens of thousands of advocates, parents, and concerned citizens participated, and thousands began following National School Choice Week on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Thought leaders from across a broad social and political spectrum added their voices to the bipartisan call for reform. This is what we need. Education was my ticket in terms of the American dream. Hello, I'm John Boehner, and I'm all in for National School Choice Week. I'm in for National School Choice Week. I'm in for National School Choice Week. I'm in for School Choice Week. The news coverage was constant, reaching all 50 states and over 34 million Americans. From national television to local papers, School Choice Week resulted in over 550 news stories. The first ever National School Choice Week officially wrapping up today. The goal to put the spotlight on education reform. And I think National School Choice Week is pointing out to people that we all have to work together for the benefit of children. It's one of the issues, one of the rare issues where Republicans and Democrats agree, young and old agree, no matter where you live, urban, suburban, and rural. Hundreds of school choice supporters rallied on the steps of the state capitol today. Hundreds of people packed into a North Raleigh hotel to talk about the future of education in North Carolina. Hundreds Hundreds of Pennsylvania residents are headed to Harrisburg this morning to fight for school choice. Families took their push for school choice to the Georgia State Capitol today. I'm sitting in Chicago today where there are over a thousand parents that were rallying for school choice outside of the Chicago School Board meeting. It's a National School Choice Week scarf. Lawmakers took notice. Eleven governors declared the week School Choice Week in their states and signed proclamations making it official. 
This morning, I issued a proclamation declaring Arizona School Choice Week. Groundbreaking legislation was introduced in many states. I am humbled to join this group of state lawmakers from both parties uh, who are coming together to focus on and highlight the fact that it is National School Choice Week and we want to move the ball on school choice in our great state of Missouri. We wanted to kind of pair this press conference with National School Choice Week. School Choice Week was even brought to the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives. I rise today in honor of a grassroots movement that is currently taking place all across our great nation, the celebration of National School Choice Week. Three award-winning documentaries, The Cartel, Waiting for Superman, and The Lottery, played a significant role in the success of the week. Over 50 screenings of the documentaries took place across the country. Bob Bowden, director of the film The Cartel, attended many of these events himself as part of an expansive speaking tour. The Education Revolution Tour visited 11 major cities and held town hall meetings with panel discussions by well-known talk radio hosts, community leaders, and education reform activists. The events drew thousands of attendees and gained widespread national media attention. When Lisa said that this session would be called the tipping point for school choice, I was really excited because that's, that's what National School Choice Week is all about. Um, it's an event-driven movement to raise awareness and uh, from the ground up. I, I, I feel like as a suburban soccer mom myself, before I was working at the foundation, I had never heard of school choice. I thought my school was fabulous. You know, I pay a lot of money in taxes and I, my house was pretty expensive. I think my school has to be, you know, awesome. So I think we have a, a, a difficult job because the people that will benefit first and most from school choice really have the least political, the smallest political voice. It's the, it's the people like me who are voting and involved and, you know, educated and living in the suburbs that are, are not really bringing pressure to bear on legislators to, to make changes in education. So that is um, job number one for us. It's, it's really to, to reach my demographic and um, br bring us closer to the tipping point and, you know, create the social epidemic that will make this happen. Okay, I'm going to ask you to tell one final story, okay? So the Whoopi, the Whoopi. right? The beloved Whoopi. Has a little controversy of its own. We're, I think Claire has coined it Whoopi Gate. Whoopi Gate. And it happened in Idaho, and, I, and this just happened last week, right? So I thought that it might just see how the yellow scarves are causing trouble around the United States, so, the Whoopies. So already the... Um, the unions fear this scarf. You should wear it with pride. You should, because this little $3 scarf last week in Idaho, on the penultimate day of their session, uh, they were voting on a uh, charter bill to lift the cap from six a year. They were trying to remove this cap. So they went out for lunch, and during lunch, one of the uh, Idaho uh, school choice groups there handed out the whoopee to the legislators. And when they came back into the session, they were wearing these. Um, so, and you have to obtain permission to distribute anything. So per correct permission had been obtained. However, that information had not made it to the floor in time, mysteriously. So the, um, the floor, the minority leader there, the Democrat, stood up and was outraged that there were promotional gifts and these scarves were on the floor and they were swaying the vote and that was, that was against the House rules and uh, he managed to table the bill. Um, and there was only one day remaining in the session, so the bill was tabled. We got a Google alert about this while we were at a meeting, and I just couldn't even believe it. Oh my God, the Whoopi has killed the charter school bill. So the next day, on the last day of the session, they reintroduced a new bill, which did pass the first stage, but they didn't have time to um, put it through. So essentially, I, you know, the message here is that the unions have been paying their politicians way too much. They could just get their vote with a $3 scarf. <laughs> so this is a pretty powerful piece of fleece right here.